So the official title uh, of my talk is Understanding Plant Response to Stress, Turning Knowledge into Application. Because every science, if, if we think that it's a breeze, then two pillars are there. There is continuous debate in scientific arena that some people tell they are doing basic science and others they are doing translational science. But I used to believe that it is just a breeze. You have two pillars and one is the basic research and the other is translational research. And on that above, you have a foundation. So any of these pillars is gone, probably the breeze is not there. That is why the any science you do, whether it is a plant science or uh, animal science, medical science uh, or you know microbiology, the, the knowledge you gather that has to be then translated into product. Therefore, I made this uh, title that uh, understanding the stress response of plants and how this knowledge can be transformed into application. Now, you might have seen many places, suppose this is an auditorium, you will always find that some sign is there, is written exit. Exits used to given in case of there is fire, there is any accident. So this shows that this is the way you can escape and save yourself. Now you imagine when a plant is subjected to stress condition, there is no exit because Plants are suicide, non-motile, it cannot move. So every stress condition, whether it is abiotic stress, abiotic stress means stress from environmental factors, like light, it can be light, it can be temperature, it can be salinity, heat, water stress, all these. It can be biotic also uh, from different microbes. So the essence of this slide is that when plants is subjected to stress, like animal or human, there is no exit. So they have to respond to the, this adverse factor in their own way. And let us try to understand how plants actually sense the stress and what they do in sensing. So response of plant to stress it depends on, or I can tell the responses, plant responses to stress are modulated by different factors. This is the environmental stress, and a while ago I said it can be biotic, it can be abiotic. Now when plants is subjected to this stress condition, it depends on how severe this stress is. How, what is the duration? If the stress is a short duration or it is a long duration, number of exposures. For example, a plant, the life cycle is three months or four months. During this life cycle, how many times the plants undergone stress condition? And combination of stresses. It can be that a plant is infected by a virus or a bacteria and at the same time, plant undergo dehydration, there was no water. So this is a combinatorial factor of stress. These are actually the stress characteristics, but it is also modulated by some characteristics in the plant itself. Where, which part of the plant is exposed to the stress condition, organ or tissue. Stage of development, you will find that many crop plants are there during their seedling stage, if it is subjected to stress condition, it can never survive. However, if it is late in their developmental stage, the same plant subjected to stress condition, probably they survive. So this, sta this stage of development or developmental stage is also very important. And the lastly is genotype. Genotype means variety. For example, other than model plants, Arabidopsis, for example, rice is there, or chickpea is there, or wheat is there. Hundreds of varieties are there and they have different degree level of tolerance. One genotype will be there, it cannot tolerate a certain stress condition, but you will find another variety of the same species can tolerate it. So it depends on the genotype. Now, on this characteristics, response can be of two types. You can broadly classify the responses into two classes. 
one is resistance another is susceptibility if the genotype is resistant obviously it will survive and it will yield product and if it is not if it is hypersensitive they ultimately it will die so that is the end result now i have taken seven i think yeah seven uh, major crops and try to understand that currently available data tells that because of environmental stress factor what happened to the yield potential of those crops in seven plants i will not read the entire slide here but few example i am showing you for example wheat if congenial agricultural potential atmosphere is available is prevail then you will see that nearly 15000 kg per hectare yield can be there in wheat if everything is fine but that never happens in nature so because of stress condition different stress condition the farmers used to yield 2000 kg per hectare now you can imagine the loss and if you go through all this list and come to the last column then you will find that on an average the crop loss in all these important crops are 65 to 85% only due to stress condition now today i am not going to talk the all sort of stress only picked up the water deficit or dehydration why we work on dehydration it is simply because water is the central to all physiological processes in plant you cannot name a single physiological process that function without water it is the major medium for transporting metabolites and nutrients and therefore the water deficit condition or dehydration limits crop production worldwide especially in developing countries and the existing data sets say that out of 1500 million hectares of crop land only 250 million hectares are irrigated and that irrigated that irrigated crop land provides 40% of crop yield annually rest 60% come from rain fed agriculture that is re that is the reason that a year when a little problem is there with rainfall you see you see havoc the loss of crop productivity there is a report we uh, we found in uh, netol you can see in google if you type google that uh, uh, fao report that shows that water deficit or dehydration is not only problem for the fauna the plant it is also for the flora this is a picture i found that reuter had given is an international award for this photograph given in a sub saharan countries where a fellow local fellow actually washing his face with cow urine because there is no water in the vicinity the situation is so bad and you had you united nation wants that if this thing goes on then there will be extreme problem in some part of the world they divided the classified at least several countries classified into two different groups one is extreme risk countries that falls afghanistan congo ethiopia somalia sudan but if you see here this is alarming the entire southeast asia also at high risk therefore all these slides together tells you that water deficit condition or dehydration is a serious threat for the mankind throughout the world now when we are telling so much water deficit and dehydration it gives you a glimpse that there is an intimate relationship between crop yield and the product what you get if i show this picture it is nothing but a cup of tea but it tells many things let's see what it tells it tells A standard cup of tea of 250 ml requires to produce a cup of tea actually you need 
30 liters of water. Have you ever thought that when you sip a cup of tea, actually you are, that is produced at the expense of 30 liters of water. And if it is a cup of coffee, just look at the figure. 140 liters of water is used just to give that much coffee for your one cup. That is the intimate relationship between crop yield and water. That gives you a thing that we should understand the dehydration response and its relation to crop yield. So therefore, one of the main area of my own laboratory is adequately sensing water deficit or dehydration identification of stress responsive proteins and then utilizing some of these novel protein in crop improvement. This is a straightforward objectives of my research work. The scientific basis of all crop improvement, the first thing is the identification of the genes or the gene products. The students sitting here in this auditorium, you understand the correlation or relationship between gene and a product. Gene is nothing but a DNA sequence. And when this DNA sequence translated, it gives rise a protein. And protein is nothing but the character or a trait. So what, the, what we are telling that the crop improvement, the main basis for crop improvement is you have to identify a gene or a gene product that is the protein and that correspond to a phenotypic, phenotypic characteristics. Once you identify a protein or a gene, you can transfer it to a crop through genetic engineering and that is what I will tell you in next several slides. And the workflow, the experimental workflow is simple as the way it is depicted here. You isolated the protein mixture, looks like this mixture, and then you differentiate or resolve this protein mixture into a gel. And you know this gel is telling that this separation is a two-dimensional separation because all of you know, even at BSc, even 12 standard also you know that the nucleic acid, the DNA, RNA molecule, as well as proteins, these are charged molecules. So, in the first dimension, the proteins are separated on the basis of their charge, and the second dimension, the proteins are separated on the basis of their molecular weight. So, first dimension, and then another dimension, that is why it is called two-dimensional electrophoresis, that is how you separated each of these proteins individually. And like nucleic acid, proteins are also colorless. So when these proteins are resolved in a gel system, you have to identify them by staining. There are many different staining procedure. So when you stain it, and in the picture you see this type of spot, these spots actually represent a particular protein. You excise this protein, you can excise it by manually or you can excise by automatic program. You digest it by trypsin. All of you know that proteins are also called polypeptide. So when you subject the polypeptide or a protein with trypsin enzyme, it cut into pieces and then there are mass spectrometry. This digested protein you load into mass spec machine, you get a spectra like this and then computer program tells you what is the probability of this protein, what is the putative name of this protein or putative function of this protein. So this is how you start from a tissue and then come to protein identification because you are looking for a trait or a character represented by a protein. Then if when you identify a protein, you go back to the root that is the gene encoding for this protein. Is it clear to you? Next. So when I say that it is a proteomic approach, now the question is, in this era, we know that almost, all, not almost, from prokaryote to eukaryote, many plants and animals, the genomes are decoded. You know, rice is having 35,000 genes, human having 30,000 of genes, because this work started in 
late 90s and 1986 the terms came that is called genome and genomics genome is nothing but total content of gene in a cell and genomics is the study of genome and 10 years after that means in 1996 two more word the mirror word came into existence that is proteome and proteomics and what is proteome proteome is defined as the complete set of protein in a cell or a tissue or a organ or organism at a given time or at a given state so that is the entire protein set is the proteome and similarly genomics here it is proteomics the study of proteome is proteomics and see this gentleman mark wilkins with his boss williams actually they coined the term and this was first introduced introduced this to term in 1994 but if you look in literature you will find that this to term actually published in 1996 two years after they coined this to term that is how the proteome work started now the question is i started with genome genomics and then proteome and proteomics question is when you know every gene in a organism 30000 gene in human or 35000 gene in human why do you need to know the protein the best example is this we have taken four example this is a prokaryote is a bacterial cell hemophila influenzae and then saccharomyces cerevisiae is a budding yeast you have c elegans you know hepatitis elegans and drosophila or the fruit fly let us now compare and see what is the genome size and what is the complexity of this organism because for identifying any gene or a protein you have to understand the complexity of that organism first in hemophila influenza the genome is coded and we know now that 2000 genes are there next you go to saccharomyces cerevisiae it is a more complex because it is the simpler organism and it is a little more complex organism and the number of gene is 6000 so there is a positive correlation the more the complexity the more the gene that makes you satisfied but come to next to column C elegans and then Drosophila. C elegans is a ribbon-like structure. It is a simple structure, simple an organism. But look at the number of gene. Eighteen thousand gene is there in C elegans, and fruit fly. It is having almost every organ. It is having head, eyes, wing, legs, what not? Every organs are there. So complex an organism. but the number of gene is 13000 now you think the complexity versus the genome size it doesn't matches here more gene is there but the structure is simple less gene is there the structure is complex that is that means that the complexity of organism does not depends on the number of gene or the genome size where it depends it depends on the protein why there was a time this 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 maximum of lecture because when the director talked to me he said that you don't give lecture on molecular hardcore molecular biology so i would like to tell you that there was a time used to believe that gene and protein is one is to one single gene and single protein but that is not valid now we know the gene is less the proteins are more am i correct the reason is that if you look at the structural configuration of a gene then you will find a gene is having axon interrupted by an intron then again an axon interrupted by then again an intron and then during this alternative splicing you get multiple of protein that means the gene is the same but during translation you get actually more protein now the this is the reason that in a particular point of time even if you have 10000 gene in a cell your number of protein can be million that that now arithmetically also prove that this is this has to be the term so 
we now know that complexity depends on the number of protein, not number of genes. That tells you that you should complementarily know the transcript as well as the translated product if you are to eradicate, be it a cancer study, uh, tuberculosis, or in this case it is a plant I am talking about. So protein is important for this reason. Now, I am now going into, uh, now I will give some of the examples that my laboratory does and if you have any question, please do ask me question. Now we do, we do proteomics, identification of protein through proteomic approach. But let me tell you one thing, that we never work on whole cell level. Because if you extract protein from a whole cell, then the protein will come from cell wall, from plasma membrane, cytosol, mitochondria, vacuole, etc, etc. All the organs. Now what happens, two examples only I will give you. If, if you are working with a plant tissue and extract the protein, maximum protein will be a single protein but maximum population will be rubisco because any point of time a plant cell contain 45% of rubisco. If it is an animal cell, albumin will be the disastrous thing because 50% protein of animal cell actually a single protein that is albumin. Now what happens, the low abundant protein get marks under that heavy amount of one population. To come out of this trouble, now we fractionated the cell. Uh, cell. You take out cell wall or in case of animal, it is extracellular matrix. You take out membrane, nuclear, cytosol, citratum. Now we are also taking out mitochondria, vacuole, chloroplast and purify those organs. And once you have purified nuclei or mitochondria, then isolate the protein. That protein will be mitochondrial protein. That protein will be nuclear protein. No other part will be there. Then you can analyze this protein and whatever you will get, these are actually either nuclear protein, mitochondrial protein or cytoplasmic protein. Now, the plant proteomics, I, I should tell you a little bit about plant proteomics. There is a paper in Journal of Proteomics in 2013. It shows clearly the first plant proteomics paper globally was published in 1999 or 2000, during this period. This was the period that I, with a small PhD group, PhD students in my laboratory, started plant proteomics work. This year. And then, down the line, I published a paper in Journal of Proteome Research. I ne that time I never understood that one day it will give me so much dividend. Now it proves there is a paper in again in Journal of Proteomics that says birth of plant proteomics in India and new horizon. And this paper tells that my this paper is the first Indian plant proteomics paper. We also understood that this is not the first Indian plant proteomics paper. This is the first cell wall in any pl crop plant. This is the first cell wall proteome map of in globally. This is the first paper. So this boasted us that we should work more and more in other organelles. And then starting from extracellular matrix, then we entered the cell interior. We gone to mitochondria, chloroplast, nucleus, etc., etc. And just for a glimpse, that after that, there was not looking back. Almost all organelles, we develop proteome map. And not only simply proteome map, we also develop that under stress condition, what are the proteins differentially regulated, differentially expressed into those organelles. It is simply because the student knows that a protein function is dependent on their localization. Because there are many protein, multiple localization. A protein A does a particular function when it is present in the cytosol. But the same protein does a second function when it is migrated to nucleus. And this migration is called nuclear cytoplasmic trafficking or migration. 
therefore it is very important that simply you do not look for the function of this protein you also look where it is localized because the same protein can give two different function because of their different cell localization now i will go a little faster so we made a model in the lab that how do you monitor the dehydration or water stress after subjecting the seedlings into drought condition two examples i have taken you know this is this is called chickpea or chana always you eat chickpea i don't know assam what you call this is there any local name for chickpea okay so this is a legume and this is rice all of you know this is cereal and you understand the difference between cereal and the legume but this is a model we established in the laboratory so chickpea is a 3 week old seedlings and rice is 4 week old seedlings you sense for unstressed condition so this is how it looks unstressed condition the leaves are flattened like this now you withdraw water or withheld water and monitor what happens to the seedlings in case of chickpea or in case of rice until 48 hour basically you do not see any problem with the plant that mean flattened leaves are flattened but after 48 hours the stress aggravated now you see leaf start leaf curling curling from the edges of the leaf and at severe condition for example in 144 here also in 144 the actually the plants droops this is called in biological system it is called wilting of plant so you understand visually that the seedlings are under stress condition so you can monitor it another important aspect of this that you do not go until 144 hour of dehydration suppose 120 hour of dehydration and then rewater the plant and wait for 24 hour this is recovery phase of plant you see there is no difference between the unstressed plants and the stressed plants it come back to normal it is same with rice also so we classify those genotypes <coughs> as resistant genotype a little while ago i said that there are different de level of degree of tolerance so you can identify in any crop species which are the susceptible cultivar and which are the resistant cultivar this is the simple method that we developed in the laboratory and that is why you said this is called footprint of dehydration you can do a simple experiment and can identify within a crop species that which are the genotype resistant and which are the genotype susceptible now we will take a resistant variety because the question we are asking why this genotype is resistant why the other is hypersensitive in order to know that we have taken a resistant cultivar uh, i just have one okay so yeah. you take 120 hours or 144 hours to i mean decide the recovery take one from one thing or more than that so you 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 give stress condition for 120 hours and then you give water for 24 hours recovery so if you increase that uh, say stress so say to 40 hours what will happen what will i mean then you put water for 24 hours will it come back that is what right i think i will answer in a different way because actually making this model here i actually took maybe half a minute 30 second i said that we made a model in the laboratory to classify which are the variety resistant and which are the variety susceptible but it took my laboratory to understand two years that what should be the condition what should be the size of the pot how many plants to be there in every pot how much water every day you are to put and after that when you withdraw water what is the loss of water every day from the seedling it takes a lot of time to you know uh, normalize this system now what you are asking you don't look at that particular 144 hour and 244 hour suppose in this cases in a particular shape of a pot every day we pour 300 ml of water suppose your pot size is small 
you could have given 100 milliliter of water and gone for 240 that is not the question question is that you have to standardize a system and under identical <coughs> condition you <coughs> see which are the resistant and which are susceptible in this case in this model we found that 144 is the serious stress condition beyond that even if you put water the plant doesn't come into normal condition is it clear here basically i am asking <laughs> sometimes i forget to water my plants and go on holiday <laughs> so okay. whether i can escape for one week and come back and record it <laughs> no that will be busy <laughs> <laughs> When the addition takes place? When? When the addition takes place? Yeah. When dehydration takes place? When you withdraw water, dehydration takes place? <laughs> I didn't, possibly I did not understand your... That is a continuous process, transpiration is occurring all the time. Because if you stop, this spot is there, every day Mali used to put water. If Mali stop watering this plant, as I showed here, 48 hours, you do not see any dehydration. That means two days it will take whatever the water will be there in the in the soil within the pot that will be sufficient. But after two days, maybe after three days, you will see that uh, the plants undergone dehydration. I think, sir, his question. I, I am thinking that if it is not a pot, it is field condition. Oh, field condition is a different thing. I think. <laughs> field condition is a different thing. Monsoon, if it is on set late, mm -hmm. you have to have monsoon in the month of June. If it is not coming up to September, then all the other people... Then you depend on the soil condition also. Uh, sir, so, soil, 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 I, I, I tell you, I have, I, I, I have given 40 minutes time. If yeah, I can yeah. complete my lecture, then I will talk five minutes on the dehydration and drought. Uh, so uh, I, this I will not take much time because I now I am going to tell you that from this resistant cultivar, then we isolated cell one or the extracellular matrix. You know the animal cell and plant cell, the difference is that animal cell doesn't have cell wall, but they do have extracellular matrix and plant cell has having cell wall. So since it is plant, we have isolated the extracellular matrix, but here it is wall. So under, under electron micrograph we studied to, uh, to understand that what we isolated actually clearly it is a cell wall. We also said that it, uh, we also tested whether there is any contamination from the plasma membrane because in cell the plasma membrane and the cell wall are closely associated. Now how you understand that? There is a chemical staining, PTA it is called, phosphotungsten acid staining. So we have taken a normal leaf here. PTA state and you can easily see the lining is the plasma membrane and in between this is the cell wall. This is one cell, this is another cell. Isolated cell wall, we also added PTA. Now here you can see there is no iota of plasma membrane. So we understand that this is a purified, pure a isolated cell wall. Once you identify it, then you isolated protein. Now I will go a little faster because I do not like to take you to the very deep into the molecular biology. But I said this much that we isolated cell wall and purified it and confirmed it by method that shows that it doesn't have any contamination. So these proteins are resolved into two dimensional gel which I explained previously. Now we developed the proteome from unstress 24 hour, 48, 72, 96, 120, also from 144 hour. And all these seven time points proteome integrated by a computational method that made simply this figure. We are terming that this is the dehydration responsive cell wall proteome. You got my point? So now, Whatever protein you are seeing here, these are all differentially regulated. I summarize this way 
that we identify 163 proteins are differentially regulated, 25 were upregulated, 38 were downregulated, 25 and 38 is 63, another 100 proteins were mismatching. That means not always it was upregulated, not always downregulated. In some points it was upregulated, in some other points it was downregulated. That is the conclusion of 163 proteins that we detected. 134 protein we subjected to mass spec and identify 110 protein. So these proteins are actually dehydration regulated protein. Now I will end up with because I said you that the first part is identification of a protein and then utilizing that protein to make an improved tolerance in plants. Now how we did it? Can you see these red circle marks? So these four proteins when we identify appear to be these proteins are ferritin. Ferritins are ubiquitous protein. It is present in all sort of organism. Ubiquitous means this. That it presents in prokaryote, it presents in plant, animals, lower eukaryote, higher eukaryote. Particularly ferritin in plants are called phytoferritins. Am I right? So all these proteins are phytoferritins. Now you remember we started with cell wall or extracellular matrix and we found ferritin. The first complaint was that any plant biologist or any biologist will know that in plant system the ferritin are the protein, is, uh, these are plastid protein, it localized in the chloroplast. How come you can get it in the cell wall? So my student also said, sir, these are contamination because plastid is so abundant in plant, probably we identified a wrong protein in this cell wall. I was convinced almost. I said repeat this experiment. We repeated this experiment several times. Every time we got that ferritin is a upregulated protein in the cell wall. That was a turning point in my life to believe unbelievable things. So we identified a ferritin and we, we understood this is a new species of ferritin never been reported in the literature. So we named this protein. You know the chickpea biological name is Caesar irritinum because it's a two syllable number. Caesar is the generic name and irritinum is the species name. So Caesar irritinum we have taken C and A and ferritin FER and this is the first protein that we have identified in cell wall. So we named it. CAFER1, Caesar irritinum ferritin 1, FAR1, kefir 1 you can tell. Last month this, oh this, this paper was published in molecular and cellular proteomics. This is also first paper from India in MC. So we understood when this paper was accepted, we were sure that we actually got an magical things in hand. I showed these spots, so then we cloned this gene. Because if you know the protein, you can easily go back to the nucleotide sequence. Am I right? So we cloned the gene and named the same name, C. kefir 1. <coughs> this paper came in last month, published in scientific report. I summarize it. So the protein is the kefir 1 is a small protein, 38, 38, 28 kDa protein with a PI value of 5.5 and it is having 254 amino acid. You know how to calculate the Dalton of a protein? The number of any amino acid multiplied by 110, the Avogadro number, you get 28 kDa. This is the protein. We also, since we have cloned the gene, now we know the distance size is 1 kb, 995 is almost 1000 base pair or 1 kb and its coding sequence that means the sequence that produce the protein is 765 base pair. 
with this before the paper was published we filed a patent and luckily i was awarded in the united states patent grant for this protein because this is the first ferritin that we identify from the extracellular matrix now <coughs> i will not tell this but for some of the students that we ask this question if the protein is differentially regulated under dehydration what about its transcript the gene because the gene already we clone here only i will mention the if, if you can see this band sizes the intensity then you will understand that under dehydration the gene is upregulated the protein was also upregulated here you can see the gene also upregulated under sodium chloride it is upregulated that means it tells that not only kefir 1 is dehydration sensitive it also sensitive to multivariate stress factor any stress you give to plant this ferritin actually over expressed the next question we asked where the gene expressed the because we found the gene the protein in the extracellular matrix at cellular level in organ level where it is expressed so we studied the rna here it is a northern blot so we understood the gene is mostly present in the pod and the stem very little in the root and leaf there is no protein and uh, there is no transcript so this is the summary of the transcript analysis now this is the last part how much i have taken No problem. So you can take. So you can take the time. Okay. So in animal, who does in I mean who does animal biology or animal lab? They all of them know that in animal system, ferritin present in the extracellular matrix, cerebrospinal fluid. In mammalian system, ferritin is present in the uh, secretum. So we ask. is it that this protein is also in the extracellular space because the protein goes to the extracellular part once it has to cross the cell wall it may be that we have picked up the protein from the cell wall when it was migrating from the interior to the external side and that period probably it was in the cell wall to understand that we made a suspension culture this is again chippy callus we made a suspension culture and then by antibody you just don't look into all these figures you will be confused only i am telling that we have developed a suspension culture and from the suspension culture we we against the against the protein protein is antigen we made a antibody so there is a re cross uh, reaction between antigen and antibody and doing this antigen antibody reaction we identify that this protein actually present in the secretum it is a further step that like animal protein that kefir one is also goes to the secretum and probably our previous identification during that migration we picked it from the cell wall now functionally how you understand its function so one thing you remember that any protein function or any gene function there can be two different way you can identify the function of a protein you can prove the function first is the negative way that means you knock out the gene from the system positive way you over express it by making transgenic plant okay so we do we did not have any mutant for for this plant the ferritin mutant was not there but luckily we identified that there is a saccharomyces cerevisiae strain devoid of a iron metabolizing enzyme so we picked up that you know the mutant mutant means devoid any strain or any organism devo lack of that particular protein or gene is a mutant now you just look at where i am pointing otherwise you will confuse now you look at only this part so we have taken this is a white type saccharomyces and this is a stress condition overload iron now you see if you stringently put iron iron overload 
this wild type up to this level the wild type is fine but here a little disturbance is there in growth however the mutant this is the y is the mutant this yfs is the mutant it actually cannot grow look at here paracot under paracot stress condition the y type is not that much affected but it under high stringent condition it cannot grow the mutant cannot grow at all under this stress condition <coughs> now we have taken two strain that means we have put kefir one again in the con in the wild type background and also in the mutant background this is our expressing line you see it can grow the mutant complemented with kefir one it is much better so the conclusion is that kefir one when you put into the mutant background of saccharomyces cerevisiae at revert back to the normal condition that means it can complement this is the first proof of the functionality now the last part is that any for a, from a plant point of view you identify a protein from a plant why don't you prove it in a plant system in order to do that now we have taken a plant system so you know the agrobacteria mediated transformation i will not narrate it this is a process how a gene can be transferred you take from one system and you can over expand to you can transfer the gene into other system and the and the scientist got this idea from a crown gall disease this is called crown gall disease is a done by agrobacterium is a soil borne bacteria and there is a ti plasmid ti means tumor inducing mechanism so from this funda it came the genetic engineering hypothesis has come so this process is called agrobacterium mediated genetic transformation through this process <coughs> now you identify a gene of your interest you make a recombinant construct this is the plant part and you can inoculate with this recombinant part and plant part and one day you will get a plant that is called genetically modified plant or transgenic plant so we did the same thing now don't look at these graphs simply come here so two things again we made down regulated ferritin from arabidopsis this is the first set and the second set i will show where we have over express it now when you down regulated then what happens these are two different independent transgenic line this is the wild type under any stress condition the wild type can germinate and can develop it develop into shoot it gives rise to leaf and root but if you down regulate or knock out the ferritin what happens none of this seed can germinate that means if you knock out ferritin from plant system it viability is lost it cannot develop that not only that is it a stress responsive protein it actually also regulates its development so minus ferritin plant becomes susceptible to stress condition this is the first proof the second is now we over express it here is the result of our expression oe means over expression so oe1 and oe3 two different independent plant and if you compare with the wild type plant you can see that its growth is much bigger as as compared to the wild type and when the wild type plants are still in the vegetative phase these plants are at the reproductive phase by this time you get flower you get silic and seed also and look particularly on the silic size this is over express plant this silic are much better and we have also estimated i determined the seed weight and we found that the over express plants the seed weight the silic size and the seed weights are much better than their wild type counterparts so if i conclude here then i will tell this much by proteomic approach from a chickpea plant we identified a protein which is a ferritin or a phytoferritin we named it at kefir 1 we try to understand its functionality first we proved it to saccharomyces cerevisiae and found that in the mutant background when you complement with kefir 1 it gives better growth it can sustain the stress condition later on we mutate 
we mutated this protein in plant system, over express also in plant system and established that ferritin expression is better for the plant development and nutrition and ultimately for harvest. I think I will not take more time. There are always a, when a plant scientist narrate his or her work on genetic engineering, then the normal question comes, are these plants suitable for eating? Genetically engineered crops are good or bad, health hazard. This, this debate is continuously, it is a going on in a debate. I will only finish my talk with this slide that actually we have been, the human population on this earth have been modifying the crops for 10,000 years through natural selection. There are hardly any crop plants which are not genetically modified. All crops we grow today have undergone extensive genetic changes from their wild ancestors. Our forefathers what used to eat we are not eating that products anymore. So there, whether in the laboratory we do genetical modification or not, natural selection, through natural selection, genetic modification is continuously being done. Crops, strain, genes have moved around the globe. Geographical distribution, there is no barrier. The gene pool is always being changing throughout the globe. So there is no problem for genetic engineering. And end of the day, when a product goes to the to the market, there are many regulatory systems, and I personally believe that there is no there is no actual problem in taking genetic engineering into our time. And whatever I discuss with you, lots of money needed for research work, and I used to get money from the Department of Biotechnology and Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. And of course, a lot of money I get from my own institute. And last but not the least, whatever I told you, these are not my work. Actually, bunch of people works for me and I uh, actually I always get benefit and my students are not benefited that way the way I am benefited. So this is my present group. And the work I started telling you, starting from the cloning, identification of kefir one and patenting. This is Dipti Motion. She is now a faculty in TFIR. She did it. If you have seen my first slide, where I have shown that three, three boys and three girls, that six people started with me plant proteomics. Dipti was the first student who identified first this protein. And the last month, the scientific report paper I got, it is done by Shai Star. So it took 16 years. The story I told you today, it is a 16, 17 year old work. It was started by Kitti, ended by Shai Star. And this is my present. Thank you all very much for your kind attention.